It's a pleasure to be with you. The title of this session is Origin of Public Health, Part 4. There are no disclosures for this presentation. Objectives include review the history of epidemiology, review key definitions related to epidemiology, discuss the two stages of epidemiology, discuss the importance of the integration of public health and clinical care epidemiologic data, review the epidemiologic concepts of factors and exposures, discuss the important role epidemiology plays in public health, review the history of the international classification of diseases, review the major public health accomplishments since 1900. Three major public health practice efforts that developed since the Industrial Revolution included response to infectious disease outbreaks, response to injuries and non-infectious diseases, and the development of the field of epidemiology. We've seen in the first three parts of this Origin of Public Health series that the public response to the health problems brought about by the Industrial Revolution laid the foundation for public health as a profession in Britain and other countries in Europe and the Americas, and resulted in public health concerns for workplace safety, child and maternal health, safe and healthy housing, sanitary waste disposal, and safe and nutritious food and water. It also established public health social justice sensibility concerns for vulnerable populations and the desire to reduce health disparities and increase health equity. These commitments and concerns are still at the heart of many, if not most, public health goals and activities today. It can also be argued that this public health sensibility arose among progressive elites in response to the inequities and hardships of the poor and working people during the Industrial Revolution. With the justification and emerging methods to improve health in place, public health needed information and analysis skills to identify health problems and evaluate efficacy. Epidemiology was to fulfill this need. The word epidemiology comes from Greek roots. Epi means upon, demos means people, ology means study of. So epidemiology means the study of something that happens to people or populations. Let's first review a brief history of the field of epidemiology. Hippocrates, who lived from 460 to 370 BCE, emphasized reasoning versus superstition, setting the basis for the scientific method. Paracelsus, 1493 to 1541 CE, initiated the field of toxicology by studying the dose-response relationship of medications. John Grant, 1620 to 1674 CE, was the first to employ quantitative methods to vital statistics and has been regarded as the founder of demography or the statistical study of populations. He analyzed deaths reported in the London Bills of Mortality and is credited with producing and widely distributing the first life table, also called an actuarial table, giving age-related probabilities of survival. For example, he demonstrated that 36% of live-born children in London died before reaching six years of age. Ramazzini, 1633 to 1714 CE, founded the discipline of occupational medicine and was a pioneer in the field of ergonomics. Sir Percival Pott, 1714 to 1788 CE, described an environmental cause of cancer, scrotal cancer, in chimney sweeps. Edward Jenner, 1749 to 1823 CE, 
developed a vaccine for smallpox using the cowpox or vaccinia virus that he administered first to a dairy maid, Sarah Nelms. John Snow, 1813 to 1858 CE, is considered the father of the field of epidemiology. He was an anesthesiologist by training. He studied the cholera epidemic in London and identified the cause. Contaminated water associated with the Broad Street pump circled on the map. Each mark on the map is the physical location of a case of cholera and helped Snow deduce that the pump was essentially the geographic center of the epidemic and could likely be the culprit. His method was what is termed in epidemiology a natural experiment that is still commonly used today. A natural experiment is defined as a naturally occurring circumstance in which subsets of a population have different levels of exposure to a supposed causal factor in a situation resembling an actual experiment where human subjects would be randomly allocated to groups. John Snow made several contributions to the field of epidemiology. The powers of observation and written expression. Description of epidemiologic methods like mapping and data tables to describe an outbreak. The use of the natural experiment. Developing a practical recommendation based on epidemiologic data. Snow recommended removing the pump handle. While the parish's board of guardians was skeptical, they agreed, and the spread of cholera in the district was halted. This picture is the famous Broad Street pump with the handle removed. William Farr, 1807 to 1883 CE, developed a more sophisticated system for codifying medical conditions. William Farr was appointed in 1837 to the post of compiler of abstracts at the General Register Office of England and Wales, which registered births, marriages, and deaths. From this data, Farr published a report in 1864 showing a disproportionately high number of deaths among miners in Cornwall and concluded that labor conditions inside the mines were the chief cause of this high mortality rate. Perhaps most significant of Farr's achievements was his collaboration with Florence Nightingale. As the nursing administrator of the British Army's hospital network during the Crimean War, Nightingale was determined to prevent the loss of soldiers due to communicable diseases. Nightingale and Farr in 1855 demonstrated that even in peacetime, soldiers living in army barracks died at higher rates than civilian men of similar ages. This information resulted in reforms and improvements in soldiers' living conditions. By 1863, mortality from preventable disease among soldiers was less than that of a comparable civilian population. Robert Koch, 1843 to 1910 CE, developed the famous Koch's postulates, an extremely important tool that helps determine infectious disease etiology. The postulates include, the organism must be observed in every case of the disease. The organism must be isolated and grown in pure culture. The pure culture must, when inoculated into a susceptible animal, reproduce the disease and the organism must be observed in and recovered from the experimental animal. There were several situations in the 20th century that groomed the field of epidemiology and its uses, including the Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 to 1919, the Framingham study of 1948, intensively studying coronary heart disease, development of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Epidemiologic Intelligence Service, EIS, in 1951, the Surgeon General's Report in 1964, 
linking tobacco to significant health risks, including cancer, and the successful smallpox eradication program that culminated with the last smallpox case seen in 1977 in Somalia. Let's now consider some additional key definitions. An epidemic is defined as the occurrence of a health-related event in excess of that expected. Examples would include infections like influenza, COVID-19, Ebola, Zika, measles, meningococcus, pertussis, hepatitis C, etc. Epidemics also apply to non-infectious diseases like diabetes, suicide, heart disease, asthma, mesothelioma, etc. The term epidemic also applies to risk factors like obesity, hypertension, inadequate exercise, e-cigarette use, and exposures like those to asbestos and arianite associated with mesothelioma. Once again, the term epidemic is defined as the occurrence of not just a disease, but any health-related event in excess of that expected. The term pandemic means a worldwide epidemic. The Spanish flu pandemic, 1918 to 1919, killed 50 to 100 million people worldwide and infected 1.5 billion, one third of the world's population. Other pandemics include the 2009 to 2010 H1N1 influenza season and COVID-19 from 2019 to 2023. This definition provides more detail of the field of epidemiology. Epidemiology is the science concerned with the study of the factors determining and influencing the frequency and distribution of disease, injury, and other health-related events and their causes in a defined human population for the purpose of establishing programs to prevent and control their development and spread, also including the sum of knowledge gained in such a study. The term study in this definition means to gather and analyze data. So the field of epidemiology is primarily about gathering and analyzing health data. Epidemiologic study can be divided into two stages, including descriptive epidemiology and analytic epidemiology. Descriptive epidemiology is often the focus of state and local health departments and often represents the first part or stage of an epidemiologic study. Descriptive epidemiologic data includes time, place, and characteristics of those affected. Descriptive epidemiology data leads to tentative theories regarding cause and effect or even just an association. The result of descriptive epidemiology is the generation of hypotheses. Analytic epidemiology is usually the focus of academic institutions, the second stage of epidemiologic study where hypotheses are tested. Looking back at our definition, Let's focus on the words human population. These words are key for public health epidemiologic work. Tools to analyze data are used in many disciplines, including clinical medicine and public health, though each has a different focus. Public health epidemiology generally targets aggregate data of groups of people or populations where clinical data focuses more on individuals. The Institute of Medicine in 2012 strongly recommended that there be greater integration of public health and clinical medicine for the health and wellness of our society. This would include better integration of population-based epidemiologic data with clinical data to inform collaborative programs to ultimately improve the wellness and health outcomes of people. We need more collaboration and partnerships, including data sharing between public health and clinical medicine in the future. 
Let's now focus on the word distribution from our definition. Distribution in the definition implies that there can be variations in the occurrence of health issues in different populations. Communities are comprised of individuals across the age spectrum, subgroups of the larger population. For example, this chart shows the leading causes of death in North Dakota by age in 2017. Unintentional injury accounted for the greatest number of deaths to people between the ages of 1 and 44. Suicide was the number two cause of death between the ages of 15 and 34. Heart disease and cancer rose to common killers in middle life, being number one and two at 45 years and older. This type of epidemiologic demographic data translates into different public health strategies based on age. Disease distribution data is important for epidemiology and public health planning. Next, let's consider the term factors or determinants that influence the frequency and distribution of health issues. Factors or determinants mean any input or exposure that changes the condition of health or other defined health characteristic. This could include biologic agents like bacteria, parasites, viruses, prions, chemicals, like toxic pesticides, carcinogens, and lifestyle factors like exercise, stress, diet. The impact of exposures include things like concentration of an agent, time of exposure to an input, like the amount of sun exposure associated with skin cancer, or number of bacteria that are associated with disease onset. For example, Salmonella generally requires exposure to many organisms to cause disease, where Shigella requires very few. Let's consider factors or determinants a bit more. This graph presents the nine most common causes of death in North Dakota from 2011, including cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, stroke, injury, diabetes, pneumonia, influenza, and suicide. Obviously, the most common causes of death for the whole population in North Dakota in 2011 were cancer and heart disease. That's very helpful data, but not the whole picture. What are the underlying risk factors or determinants of health, the true etiologies of these leading causes of death? Let's look at some national demographic data regarding health determinants. Premature death is considered death before 75 years old. Of factors contributing to premature death, genetics contribute to 30% of those deaths. 40% of premature deaths were due to behaviors or lifestyle issues, personal choices. 10% were caused by healthcare system deficiencies. So if the entire population had timely, error-free treatment, the number of early deaths would be reduced by only 10%. From this data, it seems that a strategic focus on poor behavior and lifestyle choices makes sense. This is an example of how national determinant data can inform and influence public health strategies. Let's now look at factor or determinant state level data. This graph lists the risk factors, determinants, or underlying factors that caused death in North Dakota in 2011. Tobacco was the number one determinant, causing death due to cancer, pulmonary, and cardiovascular disease. Poor diets and lack of physical activity were in second place, significant as a cause of death from diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and some cancers. This is an example of determinant data that informs public health and healthcare integrated strategies at the state level to improve health and wellness outcomes. Our epidemiology definition includes the following phrase, control there, 
which means the factors or determinants, development and spread, which means the health outcomes caused by those factors. Practical epidemiology not only gathers and analyzes factors and determinants, but also outcome data. Epidemiology is generally about objective numbers, measurable quantities, counting the number of things or events. An epidemiologist can count outcome data in almost all instances. The two most common outcome measures are morbidity and mortality. Morbidity is the number of illness-related measures associated with a disease or health issue. Mortality is the number of deaths due to certain risk factors and diseases. For example, this is North Dakota epidemiology influenza surveillance data from the 2016-2017 season reported on May 25, 2017. The most common organisms that were fully typed were influenza A H3N2 and B, Yamagata. There were 7,484 total cases. Common age groups with symptoms were less than 10, 10 to 19, and 60 plus. Morbidity data, 252 were hospitalized. Mortality data, 25 deaths. Public health, local and state, along with numerous healthcare professionals and systems gather this type of surveillance data, not only for infections, but also non-infectious diseases. Good epidemiologic data is needed by public health and healthcare systems to develop adequate strategies and programs. The first word in the highlighted phrase is control. Control there, the determinants and factors, development and spread, the outcomes. Epidemiologic outcome data informs all aspects of public health and healthcare programs and strategies, including evaluation strategies, formative process outcome, program designs, health promotion, disease control, environmental regulation, healthcare facility regulation, emergency preparedness and response, community engagement, needs assessment processes, national, state, and local or community, and health policy. Epidemiology is considered an integral or foundational component of public health practice and aims to shape policy decisions and support evidence-based practice by identifying risk factors for disease and targets for intervention. The International Classification of Diseases, ICD, is an essential tool in the epidemiologist's toolbox. There are three types of prevention. Primary prevention, preventing the risk factors, determinants, and underlying causes of disease and death. This is the mission of public health. Public health is the only health profession that has as its primary mission, primary prevention. Clinical care, focuses on secondary prevention or curative care and tertiary prevention or rehabilitation and palliative care to mitigate complications and death from disease processes. Both public health and clinical care deal with all three types of prevention, but within a different set of priorities for each discipline. The area of overlap, the area of common goals, is where clinical care and public health can integrate through collaboration and partnerships, including the integration of epidemiologic data collection and analysis. As the 2012 Institute of Medicine recommended, we need more collaborations and partnerships to improve the health and wellness of the people we serve. Peter Drucker, a renowned business management consultant once stated, what gets measured gets managed, emphasizing the importance of gathering and analyzing information for business as well as other disciplines. 
Public health requires valid information about disease and death to develop and evaluate practices that improve health. The discipline of epidemiology is based on information and emerged from the practical use of data to influence health in the 19th century. John Snow used information to control the cholera epidemic in London. John Grant and William Farr compiled statistics on death and disease in England to identify public health concerns. The International Classification of Diseases, ICD, was one of epidemiology's first and most essential tools. Providing a common disease classification system as a base for scientific studies of disease causation, treatment, and prevention. William Farr stated, The advantages of a uniform statistical nomenclature, however imperfect, are so obvious that it is surprising no attention has been paid to its enforcement in bills of mortality. Each disease has, in many instances, been denoted by three or four terms, and each term has been applied to as many different diseases, vague, inconvenient names that have been employed or complications have been registered instead of primary diseases. The nomenclature is of as much importance in this department of inquiry as weights and measures in the physical sciences and should be settled without delay. In 1860, during an International Statistical Congress held in London, Florence Nightingale proposed a model to systematically collect hospital data. In 1893, a French physician, Jacques Bertillon, introduced the Bertillon classification of causes of death at another meeting of the Statistical Congress in Chicago, which is based on the principle of distinguishing between general diseases and those localized to a particular organ or anatomic site. In 1898, the American Public Health Association, APHA, recommended that the registrars of Canada, Mexico, and the United States adopt the Bertillon classification system and recommended revising the system every 10 years to ensure currency with medical practice advances. As a result, the first international conference to revise this system took place in 1900, with revisions occurring every 10 years until 1968. In 1948, the World Health Organization, WHO, assumed responsibility for preparing and publishing system revisions. The sixth revision, published in 1949, included morbidity and mortality conditions resulting in a title change to the International Statistical Classification of Diseases, Injuries, and Causes of Death, ICD. In 1968, it was decided that a 10-year interval between revisions was too short. ICD-10 was published in 1999 and ICD-11 was published 23 years later in 2022. The ICD is currently the most widely used statistical classification system for diseases in the world. In addition, some countries, including Australia, Canada, and the United States, have developed their own adaptations of ICD, including codes for the classification of operative or diagnostic procedures. This slide lists some common uses of ICD codes, creating and tracking patient treatment plans, labeling death certificates, monitoring patient safety, medical billing, insurance reimbursements and collections, collecting data for monitoring public health, health research, and understanding less common diseases by detailing their symptoms and how they connect to more well-known conditions. Additions and adjustments are constantly being made to adapt to changing needs and conditions. For example, post 9-11-2001, 
extra codes for anthrax were added due to concerns about a terrorist biologic attack. In 2013, codes for gluten sensitivity were added. In early 2020, extra codes were added on an emergency basis to track COVID-19 diagnoses. ICD-11 includes the codes for burnout issues. For an ICD code to be introduced for a condition, the condition must be sufficiently understood and identifiable. Even with the ICD system available to epidemiologists, there are still gaps in the information we have about diseases and deaths. For example, on death certificates, the causes recorded by a clinician may not paint a clear picture of the situation. If someone dies of a heart attack, Harvey Feinberg, the president of the Institute of Medicine says, you don't say he died of high cholesterol, sedentary lifestyle, and a 40 pack year history of smoking. For that matter, he notes, we don't say that she died of despair, she died of poverty, she died of heartbreak. But certainly, those are all pretty clear risks for premature death. Fundamental to modern public health is the availability of valid and reliable data about morbidity and mortality to ultimately inform interventions to prevent premature death and improve life. Clinical records and death certificates using ICD codes have become an indispensable tool of epidemiology. Public health has had many accomplishments during the 19th and 20th centuries, and epidemiology provided data and analysis to make that happen. In 1999, CDC listed 10 public health achievements that increased the lifespan of Americans during the 20th century by 30 years. 25 of those years were attributed to the work of public health. Those 10 accomplishments are listed on this slide. One, vaccination. Vaccinations have resulted in eradication of smallpox, elimination of poliomyelitis in the Americas, the control of measles, rubella, tetanus, diphtheria, haemophilus influenza type B, and other infectious diseases in the United States and other parts of the world. Two, motor vehicle safety. Improvements in motor vehicle safety have resulted from engineering efforts to make both vehicles and highways safer and from successful efforts to change personal behavior, including increased use of safety belts, child safety seats, and motorcycle helmets, and decreasing drinking and driving. These efforts contributed to large reductions in motor vehicle related deaths. Three, safer workplaces. Work related health problems such as coal workers pneumoconiosis, black lung disease and silicosis common at the beginning of the century have come under better control. Severe injuries and deaths related to mining, manufacturing, construction and transportation have also decreased. Since 1980, safer workplaces have resulted in a reduction of approximately 40% in the rate of fatal occupational injuries. Four, control of infectious diseases. Control of infectious diseases has resulted from clean water and improved sanitation. Infections such as typhoid and cholera transmitted by contaminated water a major cause of illness and death early in the 20th century have been reduced dramatically by improved sanitation. In addition, the discovery of antimicrobial therapy has been critical to successful public health efforts to control infections such as tuberculosis. Four, control of infectious diseases. Control of infectious diseases has resulted from clean water and improved sanitation. Infections such as typhoid and cholera transmitted by contaminated water, a major cause of illness and death 
early in the 20th century have been reduced dramatically by improved sanitation. In addition, the discovery of antimicrobial therapy has been critical to successful public health efforts to control infections such as tuberculosis and sexually transmitted diseases, STDs. Five, decline in deaths from coronary heart disease and stroke. Decline in deaths from coronary heart disease and stroke have resulted from risk factor modification, such as smoking cessation and blood pressure control, coupled with improved access to early detection and better treatment. Since 1972, death rates for coronary heart disease have decreased 51%. Six, safer and healthier foods. Since 1900, safer and healthier foods have resulted from decreases in microbial contamination and increases in nutritional content. Identifying essential micronutrients and establishing food fortification programs have almost eliminated major nutritional deficiency diseases such as rickets, goiter, and pellagra in the United States. Seven, healthier mothers and babies. Healthier mothers and babies have resulted from better hygiene and nutrition, availability of antibiotics, greater access to health care, and technologic advances in maternal and neonatal medicine. Since 1900, infant mortality has decreased 90% and maternal mortality has decreased 99%. Eight, family planning. Access to family planning and contraceptive services has altered social and economic roles for women. Family planning has provided health benefits such as smaller family size and longer intervals between the birth of children, increased opportunities for preconceptional counseling and screening, fewer infant, child, and maternal deaths, and the use of barrier contraceptives to prevent pregnancy and transmission of HIV and other STDs. Nine, fluoridation of drinking water. Fluoridation of drinking water began in 1945 and in 1999 reached an estimated 144 million persons in the United States. Fluoridation safely and inexpensively benefits both children and adults by effectively preventing tooth decay, regardless of social economic status or access to care. Fluoridation has played an important role in the reductions in tooth decay, 40 to 70% in children, and of tooth loss in adults, 40 to 60%. 10, recognition of tobacco use as a health hazard. Recognition of tobacco use as a health hazard and subsequent public health anti-smoking campaigns have resulted in changes in social norms to prevent initiation of tobacco use, promote cessation, and reduce exposure to environmental tobacco smoke. Since the 1964 Surgeon General's report on the health risks of smoking, the prevalence of smoking among adults has decreased and millions of smoking-related deaths have been prevented. The list of public health accomplishments was updated in 2011 by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and included expanded descriptions of the public health impact on control of infectious diseases, as well as occupational safety. The three added accomplishments were cancer prevention, childhood lead poisoning prevention, and public health preparedness and response. For cancer prevention, evidence-based screening recommendations were established to reduce mortality from colorectal cancer and female breast and cervical cancer. Several interventions inspired by these recommendations resulted in improved cancer screening rates. For childhood lead poisoning prevention efforts, findings from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey's NHANES found a steep decline between 1976 and 2008, 
from 88.2% to 0.9% in the percentage of children aged 1 to 5 years with blood lead levels greater than or equal to 10 micrograms per deciliter. The risks for elevated blood lead levels based on socioeconomic status and race also were reduced significantly. Lead intoxication, even at levels of 5 micrograms per deciliter in children, can result in inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and irritability. Other signs and symptoms of lead intoxication include learning difficulties, reduced IQ, delayed growth, hearing loss, abnormal blood cell development, and dysfunction of the kidneys. The international and domestic terrorist attacks on 9-11-2001 highlighted gaps in the nation's preparedness, including public health. Improvements were made to expand the capacity of the public health system to respond to natural and human disasters. These improvements included the use of incident command by public health agencies, along with improvements in laboratory, epidemiology, surveillance, and response capabilities of the public health system. Public health has come a long way since the 19th century, but much remains to be done. In summary, epidemiology emerged during the Industrial Revolution. Epidemiology studies the factors associated with the frequency, distribution, and causes of health-related events. Increased data sharing collaborations and partnerships between public health and clinical medicine are needed. The international classification of diseases is a major tool of epidemiology. 25 of the 30 increased lifespan years during the 20th century were due to the work of public health.